Hello and welcome to True Crime Case Files. This show deals with violent and often disturbing crimes committed against men, women and children. This material may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Martin Bryant was born on May 7, 1967, at the Queen Alexandra Hospital in Hobart, Tasmania. He was the eldest child of Morris and Carlene Bryant. Although their main residence was in Lena Valley, the family also had a beach home in Carnarvon Bay, where Bryant spent some of his early years. In a 2011 interview, his mother recalled that even as a young child, Bryant had a habit of breaking his toys and displayed peculiar behavior that made him an annoying and different child. A psychologist even predicted that Bryant would never be able to hold a job due to his tendency to aggravate people and constantly find himself in trouble. In 1979, when Bryant was just 12 years old, he was admitted to the Royal Hobart Hospital after sustaining an injury from a firework accident. During his stay at the hospital, he was interviewed by a local TV station, shedding light on his early struggles. Local residents remember witnessing Bryant engage in abnormal behaviour, such as snatching the snorkel from another boy while they were diving and cutting down trees on a neighbour's property. Teachers described him as detached from reality and lacking in emotional expression. At school, Bryant was known for being disruptive and occasionally violent, which subjected him to severe bullying from his peers. After being suspended from Newtown Primary School in 1977, psychological assessments revealed that he had a tendency to harm animals. Although he returned to school the following year with improved behavior, he continued to tease younger children. Eventually, he was transferred to a special education unit at Newtown High School in 1980 where his academic and behavioural performance steadily declined throughout his remaining years in school. Descriptions of Bryant's behaviour as he entered adolescence revealed ongoing disturbances and raised the possibility of an intellectual disability. When he left school in 1983, a psychiatrist assessed him for a disability pension and noted his inability to read or write. The psychiatrist also expressed concerns about potential schizophrenia and painted a bleak future for Bryant stating that only his parents' efforts prevented further deterioration. Despite receiving a disability pension, Bryant also worked as a handyman and gardener. In the early months of 1987, a serendipitous encounter unfolded between a young Bryant, just 19 years old, and Helen Mary Elizabeth Harvey, a woman of 54 who held a share in the Tattersall's lottery fortune. It all began when Bryant, in search of new customers for his lawn mowing service, stumbled upon Harvey's neglected mansion in Newtown. Little did he know that this chance meeting would forever alter the course of their lives. Harvey, residing in the mansion alongside her mother Hilza, quickly formed a bond with the young and ambitious Bryant. He became a familiar face, offering his assistance with various tasks such as tending to the 14 dogs residing within the house and the 40 cats sheltered in the garage. Their friendship blossomed, and Bryant found himself a regular visitor to the grand yet dilapidated estate. However, in June of 1990, an anonymous individual reported concerns about Harvey's and her mother's deteriorating health to the authorities. Medics swiftly arrived on the scene, discovering both women in desperate need of urgent medical attention. Helen suffered from infected ulcers, while Hilza had endured a hip fracture. Tragically, Hilza Harvey was eventually moved into a nursing home where she passed away several weeks later at the age of 79. The once majestic mansion, now under a mandatory clean-up order, stood as a haunting reminder of the neglect it had endured. Brian's father, recognizing the gravity of the situation, took a leave of absence from work to aid in the arduous task of restoring the interior. The local RSPCA unit was forced to intervene, confiscating numerous animals that had been living within the house. Despite the chaos and upheaval, a remarkable turn of events occurred. Helen Harvey, grateful for Brian's unwavering support during this challenging time, extended an invitation for him to reside with her in the mansion. Their lives took an unexpected turn as they embarked on a journey of extravagance, indulging in lavish spending sprees. Within a span of just three years, they acquired over 30 new cars, a testament to their newfound affluence. The peculiar duo became inseparable spending their days engrossed in extensive shopping excursions, often preceded by leisurely lunches at a local restaurant. However, as their bond grew stronger, concerns about Brian's mental state arose. During a reassessment for his pension, a note was attached to the paperwork, revealing that his father acted as a protective shield, 
aware of his son's inclination towards violence. It stated, Father protects him from any occasion which might upset him as he continually threatens violence. Martin tells me he would like to go around shooting people. It would be unsafe to allow Martin out of his parents' control. Thus, their extraordinary tale took an unexpected twist, leaving a lingering sense of uncertainty and unease. The intertwining of their lives, fueled by wealth and shared experiences, would forever be marked by the complexities of their personalities and the haunting shadows that lurked beneath the surface. In 1991, faced with the prohibition of keeping animals at their previous residence, Harvey and Bryant made a joint decision to relocate to a sprawling 29-hectare or 72-acre farm known as Torresville in the quaint township of Copping. The property had been purchased by Harvey herself. However, their arrival in the close-knit community was met with apprehension and caution. Bryant, often seen carrying an air gun, developed a reputation for his peculiar behaviour. He would aim and fire at unsuspecting tourists who stopped by a nearby Apple stall along the highway. Furthermore, under the cover of darkness, he would wander through neighbouring properties, unsettling residents by shooting at dogs that dared to bark at him. The locals, aware of his unsettling tendencies, went to great lengths to avoid any contact with him, despite his attempts at forging friendships. Tragedy struck on the fateful day of October 20, 1992. Harvey, aged 59, along with two of her beloved dogs, lost their lives in a devastating car accident. The circumstances leading to the collision involved Harvey's vehicle veering onto the wrong side of the road, colliding head-on with another car. Bryant, who was present in the car during the incident, suffered severe neck and back injuries, requiring hospitalization for a grueling seven-month period. Authorities briefly investigated Bryant's potential involvement in the accident. It was discovered that he had a habit of lunging for the steering wheel, and Harvey had already been involved in three previous accidents due to this behavior. She often confided in others, expressing her fear that Bryant would eventually be the cause of her demise. In fact, she allegedly told a neighbor, one of these days the little bastard is going to kill me. Following Harvey's untimely demise, it was revealed that Bryant had been named as the sole beneficiary in her will. He inherited assets valued at over 550,000 Australian dollars. However, due to Bryant's limited understanding of financial matters, his mother intervened and applied for a guardianship order. This order granted her the authority to manage Bryant's assets through the assistance of public trustees, as evidence suggested a decline in his intellectual capacity. The aftermath of the accident and the subsequent legal proceedings only added to the enigmatic nature of their relationship. The complexities of their bond and the circumstances surrounding their lives continue to unravel, leaving a trail of unanswered questions and an air of uncertainty. Following Harvey's passing, Morris Bryant, a 60-year-old man, took on the responsibility of managing the copping farm. Meanwhile, Bryant himself returned to his family home to recover after his hospital stay. Struggling with his emotions, Morris sought solace in antidepressants and discreetly transferred his joint bank account and utilities into his wife's name. Two months later, on August 14, 1993, a visitor arrived at the Copping property in search of Morris. To their surprise, they discovered a note pinned to the door instructing them to call the police. Additionally, they found a substantial amount of money in Morris's car. Although the rates officer initially found no cause for concern, Letters sent to the local council chambers raised alarm, prompting council members and police to intervene. Despite their efforts, a search for Morris on the property yielded no results. Eventually, divers were called in to explore the four dams surrounding the farmhouse. Tragically, on August 16, Morris's lifeless body was discovered in the dam closest to the house, with a diving weight belt tightly fastened around his neck. The police deemed the death unnatural and ruled it a suicide. As a result, Bryant inherited his father's superannuation fund, amounting to $250,000. Subsequently, Bryant made the decision to sell the copping farm for $143,000 Australian dollars, choosing to retain ownership of the new town mansion. With his newfound independence, Bryant's fashion choices took a peculiar turn. He abandoned his customary white overalls in favor of attire that reflected Harvey's affluent status. However, as he found himself increasingly alone, Bryant's wardrobe became even more eccentric. He would often be seen wearing a grey linen suit, accompanied by a cravat, lizard skin shoes, and a Panama hat, all while carrying a briefcase during the day. Bryant would boast to anyone who would listen about his successful career as a businessman. 
At the restaurant he frequented, he would don an electric blue suit with flared trousers and a ruffled shirt, drawing attention and ridicule from both staff and customers. The owner of the establishment recalled the scene, expressing sympathy for Bryant's loneliness, realizing that he lacked genuine companionship. After losing both his father and Harvey, Bryant's loneliness grew more intense. From 1993 to late 1995, he embarked on numerous trips abroad, visiting different countries a total of 14 times. The record of his domestic flights filled three pages, highlighting his constant need to escape. Surprisingly, even during his travels, Bryant felt just as isolated as he did back home in Tasmania. However, he found solace in the flights themselves, relishing the opportunity to engage in conversations with his fellow passengers who were bound by social norms to be polite. These interactions became a source of joy for Bryant, and he delighted in recounting the interesting discussions he had with his temporary companions. Unfortunately, Bryant's emotional state deteriorated to the point where he contemplated ending his own life. He believed that more and more people were turning against him, despite his attempts to be friendly. The rejection he experienced only deepened his despair. As a result, Bryant's alcohol consumption escalated, even though he had previously been a moderate drinker. In the six months leading up to the tragic events at Port Arthur, his average daily intake of alcohol skyrocketed. Half a bottle of Sambuca, a bottle of Bailey's Irish Cream, and various other sweet alcoholic beverages became his regular companions. Bryant admitted that the idea of carrying out the Port Arthur massacre had been brewing in his mind for several weeks before the actual event. However, his explanations for his actions have been inconsistent and muddled. It is possible that his motivation stemmed from a desperate desire for attention, as he allegedly told a neighbor, I'll do something that will make everyone remember me. Bryant's defense psychiatrist, Paul Mullen, suggested that the catalyst for his plan may have been the Dunblane massacre, which occurred before Port Arthur. The media coverage and portrayal of the killer, Thomas Hamilton, seemed to have a profound impact on Bryant, altering the course of his thoughts from suicide to a violent act of infamy. Driven by a deep-seated resentment, Bryant's first targets were David and Nolene Martin, the owners of the bed and breakfast known as Seascape. This establishment held significance for Bryant as it was the same property his father had desired to purchase. Bryant's father had often lamented the damage caused to their family due to the Martins acquiring the property instead. Fueling his anger, Bryant believed that the Martins had intentionally bought the bed and breakfast out of spite towards his family, holding them responsible for his father's descent into depression and subsequent suicide. In a tragic act of vengeance, Bryant entered the guest house and fatally shot the Martins, taking their weapons and the keys to the property before proceeding to the Port Arthur site. Arriving at Port Arthur, Bryant entered the Broad Arrow Cafe, carrying a conspicuous blue duffel bag. As he sat down to eat, he attempted to strike up conversations with unsuspecting individuals, discussing peculiar topics such as the absence of wasps in the area and the unusual decline in Japanese tourists. Finishing his meal, Bryant moved to the back of the cafe and placed a video camera on an unoccupied table. It was at this moment that he revealed a Colt AR-15 SP-1 carbine a semi-automatic rifle, and without hesitation, began firing indiscriminately at patrons and staff. In a matter of seconds, 17 shots were discharged, resulting in the deaths of 12 people and the injury of 10 others. Bryant then proceeded to the opposite side of the cafe, firing 12 more rounds, claiming the lives of eight additional victims while injuring two. Swiftly reloading his weapon, he fled the scene, continuing his assault on innocent individuals in the car park and from the confines of his yellow Volvo 244 as he made his escape. Tragically, four more lives were lost, and six others were left wounded in his wake. After driving a short distance from the Port Arthur site, Bryant spotted a woman walking with her two children. Seizing the opportunity, he stopped his car and fired two shots, instantly killing the woman and the child she held in her arms. The older child managed to escape, but Bryant pursued her relentlessly eventually catching up and fatally shooting her with a single bullet. Fueled by his rampage, Bryant then targeted a gold BMW, ruthlessly taking the lives of all four occupants in order to steal the vehicle. Continuing his deadly spree, he encountered a couple in a white Toyota. Brandishing his weapon, he forced the male occupant into the trunk. Before leaving, he callously fired two shots through the Toyota's windshield, killing the female driver. After returning to the guesthouse, Bryant decided to take drastic measures. 
He set the stolen car ablaze, ensuring that any evidence would be destroyed. With his hostage in tow, he led them back inside the house, where the lifeless bodies of the Martins lay. The police were quick to respond, surrounding the area and attempting to negotiate with Bryant for hours on end. However, their efforts were in vain as the battery on Bryant's phone eventually died, cutting off all communication. Bryant's sole demand throughout the negotiations was to be transported to an airport via an army helicopter. Despite the police's best efforts, they were unable to meet this demand. Tragically, during the tense standoff, Bryant took the life of his hostage, escalating the already dire situation. The following morning, after enduring a gruelling 18 hours of chaos, Bryant set fire to the guest house in an attempt to create confusion and make his escape. However, his plan was thwarted and he suffered burns to his back and buttocks in the process. Finally captured, Bryant was immediately taken to Royal Hobart Hospital, where he received medical treatment while being closely guarded by authorities. In the aftermath of the Port Arthur massacre, the media came under scrutiny for their questionable journalistic practices. The publication of manipulated photographs in the Australian, which altered Bryant's eyes to make him appear deranged and menacing, sparked widespread criticism. Despite the backlash, these doctored images continued to be used in media reporting for years to come. Furthermore, concerns were raised regarding the acquisition of these photographs, raising questions about the ethics and integrity of the media industry. The media's coverage of Bryant's case was criticised by the Tasmanian Director of Public Prosecutions, who argued that it compromised his right to a fair trial. As a result, legal action was taken against several news outlets, including The Australian, The Hobart Mercury, The Age and The ABC. David Flint, the chairman of the Australian Press Council at the time, countered this argument by suggesting that it was the law, not the newspapers, that needed to change. He believed that altering the law would not necessarily result in trial by media. The Australian newspapers were also scrutinised for their portrayal of Bryant and the understanding of the type of person responsible for such killings. In response to the mass shooting, Australian state and territory governments implemented strict restrictions on firearms, including semi-automatic rifles, shotguns with more than five shots, and high-capacity rifle magazines. There were also limitations placed on low-capacity repeating shotguns and rim-fire semi-automatic rifles. Although controversial, the opposition to these new laws was overcome by media coverage of the massacre and the growing public opinion following the shootings. Bryant's readiness for trial was assessed, and the court set the commencement date for November 7, 1996. At first, he asserted his innocence, but under the guidance of his court-appointed attorney, John Avery, Bryant was convinced to change his plea to guilty for all accusations. A fortnight later, Judge William Cox of the Hobart Supreme Court delivered a stern verdict, sentencing Bryant to 35 life terms along with an additional 1,600 years behind bars, ensuring he would never be eligible for parole. These sentences were to be served concurrently, with the life imprisonment being imposed for the entirety of his natural existence. During the first eight months of his imprisonment, Bryant was held in a specially designed cell to prevent suicide attempts where he experienced almost complete isolation. For his own safety, he remained in protective custody until November 13, 2006, when he was transferred to the Wilfred Lopes Centre in Hobart. This secure mental health unit, operated by the Tasmanian Department of Health and Human Services, provides a 35-bed facility for inmates with serious mental illness. The unit is staffed with medical professionals and support workers, and inmates have the freedom to move within the facility. Private contract guards patrol the perimeter of the unit. In July 2003, an incident occurred where an inmate sprayed a cleaning solution into his eyes, resulting in his transfer to the Royal Hobart Hospital. On March 25, Bryant attempted to end his life by slashing his wrist with a razor blade. Two days later, he cut his throat with another razor blade and was briefly hospitalized. Currently, Bryant is housed in the maximum security Risdon prison near Hobart. 